increasing. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's kick off now. Um, and then, yeah, people can continue to join as uh, I do do the introduction. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining. Um, it's good to see so many people attending an event with finance in the title. It's always a bit touch and go which way that's going to go. So it's great the, the level of interest we've seen um, and certainly you know, across the, the whole of the the last fortnight of community fortnight has been really good attendance so it's been great to see people getting involved and taking the opportunity to, to share so it's great um i guess that what we were thinking when we were preparing um the content and the and the team to to for, for this session was very much that we've seen over the last um sort of two years i suppose that the that with the removal of subsidies, renewable energy project development has somewhat been knocked sideways um, in terms of the business case for those small and medium scale projects. So I guess we wanted to pull together a team which can provide very different perspectives on where we are, where we're going, what works, what doesn't, um, and hopefully provide some uh, useful insight on that basis. So I guess what a lot of the market is very much facing or, or with the the scale of what's got to be delivered in terms of six gigawatts of renewable energy annually um, for the next 15 years um, to, to get close to net zero you you could be forgiven for for thinking that we just need to focus on absolutely enormous projects so 100 megawatt plus uh, but i think what we're seeing and what we certainly see in the sector so far is that what we shouldn't forget in this this in 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 the, the pursuit of delivery of that target is that a fifth of the current uk capacity renewables capacity is sub 10 megawatts and if we move that threshold up to 20 megawatts over a third of the uk's capacity is um is is sub 20 megawatts so i think you know, even relatively modest scale projects are a critical part of the energy infrastructure and and we can see that continuing so it's an important space that we tend to be filling as community energy groups and i think that in terms of that revenue certainty picture which is some way in some ways the missing stool or the missing leg of the stool um currently um we've got the the cfd or onshore renewables are now included in the cfd which is great um, and over the next week or so, we should have clarity on the allocation sizes for the, the different pots um, within within the, the contract for difference. So we should have uh, much better vis visibility and much more able to gauge the size and scale of projects which will be competing and qualifying within Q4's auction um, for, the, for the CFD, which for those of you who aren't familiar is a 15 year um, price guarantee effectively for renewables but what we do know about the cfd process is that if projects are sub five megawatt they won't qualify so we need to look at business models which work for that sub five megawatt scale as well um, i mean looking at the market at the moment in terms of projects that we as a community energy sector can interact with there's currently uh, or over the last 15 months 4.4 gigawatts of renewable projects in the uk have been consented so they've got received planning consent um, and a quarter of those so one gigawatt were onshore wind a third one and a half gigawatts were, were solar pv and the rest of it's offshore but i think there's still yeah there's obviously plenty of scope for us to be working with these projects as we all strive to, to deliver this threefold increase in renewable capacity so today we're going to hear from from four experts in the, the, the field, um, all with very different perspectives, which we hope is helpful. So um, we're going to kick off with Dan um, from Cornwall Insights about the regulatory policy environment. Um, then we're going to move to Monica, who's one of the Thrive, one of the Thrive team, um, talking about operating at scale. Um, and then we're going to move to Ollie um, from Riding Sunbeams and um, Community Energy South on real life examples of renewables products which are currently in hand. Um, and then final, finally working or hearing from Simon Roberts from CSE on the insights he's had from um, mentoring community energy projects. 
Um, just in terms of process and procedure, then um, it'd be great to, to have questions as we go through the presentations. What we aim to do is have a, a, a presentation from each of the, the members of the team, and then we'll have a Q&A session where we can respond as a panel to questions that are raised. So please use the Q&A function in Zoom to do that. Um, and yeah, we'll come back to that towards the end, the end of the session. Um, and if for any reason you drop off um, the, the not physically drop off, but if you um, drop off of the Zoom session, then feel free to rejoin. It will still be there. So um, yeah, just, just rejoin. So yeah, I think that's all we need to do by way of introductions, other than to say that the session is being recorded um, in case you're sensitive to that. Um, and yeah, so if you don't mind, we'll kick off with Dan. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, just bear with me while I bring my slides up. My team's veteran, but uh, not quite as familiar with Zoom. Hopefully everyone can see that. Not yet, but I'll tell you when we can. Great. Thanks, Matthew. I'll just do a quick introduction then while we're waiting for that. So I'm, I'm Dan Starman, a lead consultant at Cornwall Insight, and I work on a wide range of topics, including network charging, policy costs and regulation, small and large asset due diligence and commercial support, and heat as well. And I've been invited to talk about what we see going on in the regulatory and policy environment. Has that come up quite yet? It's it was saying that Dan's has started sharing screen but it's still oh here we go we're up yep you're good. okay it's it's the rural north norfolk internet connection unfortunately um so let's uh let's jump into this then um so i'm going to skip through just the first few slides they provide an overview of Corn cornwall insight we're an energy and water consultancy firm that support customers across the value chain from generators and producers, networks, retailers and end consumers to policymakers and regulators. And effectively, we support understanding uh, the intricacies of the market activities of market players and uh, commercial re revenue streams across the UK, Ireland and Australia as well. And we have uh, a, a wide range of services that I'll just uh, I'll just leave there. So, um, in my 10 minutes today, uh, I'll be covering network charging reforms, what's happened, happening, and potentially coming down the track, uh, some of the impacts on generators from those reforms, some other elements to look out for as well from a policy perspective, and talk a little bit about uh, flexibility and storage as well. I'll go at a canter, uh, if that's okay, because there's quite a bit to talk about. So um, to start with then, I'm sure we've all at least heard of the targeted charge and review and ongoing network access and forward-looking charges review. Bit of, a, bit of a mouthful, that one. We'll just call it the access SCR from here on in. And so the TCR focuses on the sunk or residual cost of the network. That's mostly done and dusted with the last reform to come in probably in 2023. And that's looking to effectively transition sunk network costs from unit rates into a fixed charge. And then we've got the access SCR, which is at a very different stage of development, it's fair to say. An initial minded two decision on much of the reform is expected in spring 2021, which apparently stretches into June in regulatory timescales. Given the weather, uh, I guess it's only fair to uh, forgive Ofgem for mistaking uh, June for spring, but um, we're, we're expecting a decision imminently on that. And then a decision on further reform will then come through it later in 2021. So let's jump into this second reform in a little bit more detail. Um, so uh, distribution user system charges are likely to change and, and could you also the credits associated with generating if you're connected to the distribution system are going to change. We don't know exactly how quite yet. A lot will be depend on that minded two decision. But there's a strong steer from the regulator that it wants improved locational signals. Presently, if you own a generating asset connected up to 22 kV uh, and connected to the, to the grid, you receive GJUOS credits for every unit you generate. And Ofgem is considering implementing a test at um, a primary substation to see whether the area is demand 
or generation dominated. And if it's demand dominated, there's a good chance you'll continue to receive those credits, those payments, um, because effectively you're helping offset reinforcement in the network. However, if that local distribution substation is uh, is generation dominated, there's a chance Gajuos will become a cost. So those distribution charges become a cost. So do be cognizant of that if selecting sites uh, going forwards. That's looking like the, the likely direction of travel. And uh, worth noting, a similar but inverted principle applies to demand do. So um, demand users will probably face the uh, the highest cost in a heavily demand dominated area. So if you're looking at behind the meter investment potentially, then uh, worth thinking about that as well. That's going to be a complex change. We won't see a mind or two decision on this until uh, a little bit later on in the year. The other reforms will probably be uh, implemented a little bit quicker. So transmission charges or Nuance, it's looking likely going forwards that embedded generators will need to be paid or pay transmission charges. That's generally going to be a positive, so a credit if you're in the south, more of a cost if you're in the north based on current transmission charges. And the triad charging mechanism will be reformed as well. And th this is um, effectively demand users a charge for their use over the three periods of, of peak use over the winter. Um, and it's looking likely that will be reformed. So if you've got some flexible assets behind the meter helping to avoid that, um, it, <laughs> quite how it's going to be reformed, we're not aware of quite yet. Um, there are some shortlisted options, but um, there's a potential for some of that peak uh, charge avoidance uh, to be spread out over, over uh, wider periods. In connection charging, off Jim's reviewing what it calls the connection boundary. I'm sure I'm not alone in hearing of connection charges that make projects untenable. And under the reform, off Jim looks likely to reduce those substantial upfront costs and or allow for their recovery on more of an ongoing basis. So that's a big positive for smaller scale assets looking to connect, particularly in more congested areas. Finally, we've got access rights, a really interesting one. Say you have a solar farm, uh, you only want daytime access to the networks. You, there, uh, you, you may therefore receive a discount or eventually be able to trade those access rights with other users. So more choice in ac access rights, more tailored to users of the network, and you might also be able to share those access rights with local consumers. That, in my view, is a potentially exciting development for community energy. But it's worth saying in this space, a lot depends on Ofgem's ambition here and, uh, and how exactly uh, those access rights will come through in terms of costs. So that's all great kind of uh, talking about that at a high level. But let, let's bring that uh, down into a traffic light system for a grid connected asset, so a low voltage or high voltage connected uh, generator here. So in April this year, we lost the BASUOS embedded benefit. That has around a, a £3.50, £2.50 to £3.50 per megawatt hour impact on revenues for embedded generators. We've also transitioned to a red amber green charging basis for GADUOS. So you get paid more if you're exporting power onto the grid during the peak periods. That, that second uh, change broadly works out in the wash depending on um, which asset we're, we're looking at, what what the generating profile is, etc. But clearly the, the loss of £3.50 is, is, is a bit of a blow for grid connected assets. Um, the distribution uh, TCI implementation has very little impact in April 2022, so we're unlikely to see a massive change in revenues for embedded assets there. And then from 2023, um, embedded generators, as I note, could face uh, transmission costs. So if you're located in the south of England, that's likely going to be a credit in the south. And if you're located in the north of England, anywhere north of the Midlands, generally speaking, or, or Scotland, then um, that's likely to be uh, a, a charge uh, ba based, as I say, on the current arrangements. We'll also likely see lower costs of connection to the network and the potential for access sharing at some point in the future. Um, and we will also see a more zonal distribution charging uh, regime implemented at some point. Will be a positive for some, will be a negative for others. Obviously, very locational dependent. 
uh, and that's the region uh, reason for the uh, the little compass that we've got uh, here. So you'll see that again on this slide. So uh, locationally dependent impacts. Let's do the same thing, but look at a behind the meter asset where we focus on supporting an end user in avoiding their demand charges. The story is a little bit different here, um, to be honest. There's no great impact in April 2021. The loss of the embedded benefit for BISUOS means that the cost to demand users actually falls a tiny bit, but that's lost in the noise, generally speaking. In April 2022, uh, uh, we'll see the TCR lower DUOS unit rates for most areas and move the costs to a fixed charge. So that's less cost that you can help the demand user avoid. However, the impact is highly locational. There will be little impact in regions with a small residual uh, component. So the Eastern region being a very good example there and a higher impact with regions with a high residual. So generally speaking, you're you more rural networks. Um, and London, as ever, is an exception to the rule in that the unit rates will actually go up. So you'll actually be able to, to support consumers in avoiding more cost. And you can look at the impact for all areas as the charging statements for 2022 have been published by the distribution network owners now. So you can investigate that in a little bit more detail. In 2023, uh, the transmission TCR implementation means there'll be less triad to avoid if you're supporting uh, end users avoid that over the peak period. And uh, at some point, we'll see complete reform of the triad uh, charging arrangements, which could move the charge to other times and other formats. And there's the outside chance of some potential upside there if it moves to a unit rate um, basis um, uh, over a, a wider time period, if you like. There will be greater regional allocation of charges and credits. Again, strong locational element to that. And we're also likely to see a near doubling of BISUOS costs for the demand user. So while we've lost the embedded benefit um, from perhaps 2023, uh, there's going to be much uh, much more BISUOS cost on the end user's bill. So if, you're, if you've got assets behind the meter or looking at assets, assets behind the meter, that can be an additional £2.50 a megawatt hour, etc. A few other things to consider as well. I can't talk about policy to community energy groups without at least mentioning the local electricity bill. Uh, this would allow local generators to have a local electricity supply license and supply to customers within a defined local area. Uh, it's currently in its uh, second reading in uh, in Parliament and uh, has, has a little way to go. Um, when considering behind the meter or private wire investments, it's worth considering that policy costs can make up to around 20-25% of the unit rate cost of the bill for, for an end user and therefore support the investment case for these assets. There is a lot of rumbling occurring at the moment that electricity policy, policy costs could be allocated elsewhere, the main contenders being the gas bill and kind of broader taxation. If it does move to the gas bill, that might support community energy schemes in thinking a little bit more around local heat and what a local heat solution might look like um, because the counterfactual fuel, gas, would be uh, slightly more expensive, but clearly there would be an impact on behind the meter uh, generation um, business cases, if you like. A couple of other policy bits as well. So Bayes was considering requiring capacity market units, CMU, so uh, assets providing uh, support and getting revenues uh, for being in the capacity market um, to be balancing mechanism units or, or BMUs. Um, which comes with some costs, some admin um, requirements there, but has decided against it for now. This is this is a great thing for a, a, a supportive thing for uh, uh, small scale assets, um, but uh, I think it's been pushed further down the road rather than being taken away entirely. Um, and obviously, CFD. Uh, pot one being reintroduced is a very good thing for wind and solar over five megs. Um, however, we think it will be a very competitive allocation uh, round uh, later this year. Finally, and uh, very briefly, storage. So storage capacity across GB is uh, rapidly increasing. 
As of December 2019, we had just over half a gig of battery storage. As of February this year, that had increased to 1.1 gigawatt, with a further just over half a gigawatt under construction and um, multiple gigawatts of capacity consented. Uh, consented. So. Uh, more and more storage coming onto the system. And there are a range of storage business uh, models depending on location, as I'm as I'm sure we're aware, can be directly connected to the grid, uh, co-located renewable technologies, and and support uh, behind the meter and uh, demand side response, if you like. There are a lot of potential revenue streams for those assets, capacity market, wholesale, balancing mechanism, peak charge avoidance, services to national grid, a whole kit and caboodle. And you need to actively manage and what we term revenue jump to get the most out of them. That can make assessing the business case for for the assets tricky without a a trusted partner to um, support you along the way there. Um, But to note, In the area, National Grid is reforming its frequency response and reserve products, which presents some opportunity for quick response flexibility. At the same time, as uh, barriers to small scale flexibility are lowering in the space, so more opportunity uh, there. Also, uh, DNOs, distribution network owners, um, are procuring flexibility at the smaller scale too. And this is highly locational. You're either in a region that needs support or you aren't. Uh, storage is very well placed to provide some of these services if short duration and speed is the priority. So contracts can now be up to seven years in length, which is great. Um, one of my uh, issues with the, with the schemes previously was that uh, just one or two years previously, but seven years gives you a, a good uh, level of certainty in revenues. Um, and uh, yeah, there remain a, a, a good uh, option for uh, smaller scale storage assets. Um, and that's it from me. Overall, there's a lot of change occurring in the policy and regulatory space. We'll have a clearer picture, I think, of the way forward uh, once the policy log jam following the energy white paper clears a little bit um, and Ofgem publishes its minded two decision on the network charging reforms. But my contact details are, are there should you want to get in touch. And that's all from me. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Dan. That's really helpful and great context. I mean, the, the prospect of the connection, the connection boundary point. Um, yeah, I have, well, probably it's been 15, 16 years since you could recover the cost of the connection over the lifetime of the project or at least part of it. So, um, yeah, really, good, really helpful. OK, so I've just on, on the Q&A, uh, we've had a request for um, a refresh on the agenda for today. Um, so Monica from Thrive will be going next, talking about projects at sc- operating projects at scale. Ollie from um, Riding Sunbeams and Connect uh, Community Energy South will be coming in on real life examples of renewable energy project generation. Um, and Simon Roberts from CSC will be providing some more insights on um, community energy mentoring following that. And then after that, so hopefully probably about um, sort of. 120 ish we'll be stepping into a, a Q&A where we'll pick up a number of the other questions which are now coming in so thanks thanks keep the questions coming so now I'm going to pass to Monica um, who is the investment director here at Thrive Renewables thanks thank you Matthew and thank you Dan um, I found that really really interesting uh, presentation and just before I go to my presentation I thought I'll um it just kind of struck me how um, you know when that rocks and um, feed and tariffs used to be uh, a thing that we all relied on. Um, a lot of those locational benefits, embedded benefits, all of that sort of stuff was not even appearing in our financial models. Um, but, uh, but that and the flexibility, et cetera, is, is kind of, you can see the shift really happening and the energy transition happening. And, and that's now becoming the, the really the, the heart of the business cases uh, for many projects. So. So important to understand on that. Um, thanks. Uh, in terms of um, what I prepared for today, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, just a little bit of introduction to Thrive and some of the products that we're developing. Um, and then um, uh, I, we wanted to share with you uh, some of the learning and experiences in, from um, the, the sort of funding and investment um, that, that, that we will be working on. So who we are, just a quick uh, reminder. So Thrive Renewables is a sustainable energy investment company. 
uh, we were set up in 1994 uh, by Traders Bank. We are now separate from Traders, but sort of share very much the, the ethos and the, and the vision. Um, we to date have funded 25 uh, renewable energy projects across the UK. And we typically fund projects from um, uh, half a million to 30 million. That's our kind of usual sweet spot. And, and we say we, we plug the funding gaps because we feel that uh, we can fill the space where it might be projects too big for community groups, but probably too big for utilities and, and big investors. So uh, we sort of look at, at that space. Um, and what is very unique about Thrive is that we are ourselves owned by uh, over 6,000 individual investors uh, who invested as little as five pounds and as much as five million, uh, but it's that kind of range. And that accessibility uh, is, is really key uh, for, for us. Uh, so what, what we're doing on community investment uh, specifically, but I think some of these also will be quite interesting ideas for you thinking about um, your, uh, your projects that, you, that you're working on, and how you can structure um, those, those, um, those projects from an investment perspective. So uh, on one hand, uh, we're looking at facilitating co-investments um, for larger schemes. Um, what that means is we see more and more uh, um, opportunities and, and, uh, and projects where there might be big, um, big uh, wind or solar projects being developed in your, in your local areas and local communities uh, take an interest in taking shares or, um, or, or part in those, in, in those investments. And they often need to bring um, the investor, the, the developers or utilities, a, um, a speed and certainty of, of being able to be a, a co-investor. So this is where Thrive can come in, um, but you know that's, that's something that I, I'm aware a lot of community groups are, are looking at at the moment, um, just finding, finding a way to, to buy in into those larger schemes. It, it, it will be very important uh, for the future projects, especially as the CFDs as well, uh, that Sam was talking about. Uh, are coming in. The next um, sort of product is, is joint ventures with community groups. Um, we've, uh, um, it, it's something we've, uh, we've done a long time ago on, on Havrick, uh, which is uh, one of the first wind uh, projects in UK. But we really, we really would like to do more of that and there's a few other projects where we are uh, working with community groups, uh, trying to set up um, joint ventures on, on new projects that we're investing in. It's not always a, a you know, a clear business case for that, but, um, but very much encouraging when, when we, we can do that. And a uh, sort of third route uh, is a community funding bridge. So what this is, is where we provide loans to community groups to um, buy projects um, and the loans can be repaid uh, from uh, future fundraisings. Uh, so community groups can um, kind of, um, you know, in the longer term, uh, invest on funding in projects. But that's that's a very useful uh, and very good product for uh, those situations when um, you need to very quickly raise money um, for, for, or for, for a project and you just don't have full amount. Um, and, and that's where, where Thrive can come in. Um, we have uh, done a project with Energy for All um, about three, four years ago, uh, um, uh, Meanwhile Wind Farm that was funded through, through that product. Talking about investment um, appraisal, I uh, always come back to the principles and I actually stole this slide from my own slideshow from last year. Um, because I think it's, it's quite important to always bring, come back to it and, and think about you know, what is the risk and return of, of a project when you, when you are um, deciding whether to invest or not. But the third axis that we at Thrive and, and I suspect many of you are also looking at is, is the impact that projects are, are making. So sometimes you might have um, uh, situations that you know you kind of your pot is limited of how much you can invest, but some projects are just more impact generating because they deliver more um, community benefits, or they just the scale or the CO two benefits are just so much greater. So th these these considerations are important um, as well. Um, and then um, just a few learnings from. Um, from our um, kind of um, thinking about projects and how, how we how we um, how we how we structure um, and, and some of the risks as well that we that we see um, in these days on, on projects. Um, so without subsidies, we all have to uh, think quite hard about how uh, what we invest in. Um, and uh, very much right now, the 
The revenue side is where we can see you know, so much could be done either by um, the local um, uh, local PPAs that Dan was talking about, for example. Um, it could be also done through the corporate PPAs, etc. Et it's quite important to think, you know, to, to, to also realize that uh, without subsidies, there is quite a big risk uh, from financial perspective uh, on power prices. So understanding the power prices is, is, is something um, uh, that uh, we are looking at a lot. Um, also, if you if you don't have subsidies and you're relying on the future um, on the future um, just purely um, power uh, sale, you should be uh, remembering about the um, the wind and solar kind of resource itself. Uh, it can be quite tricky. Uh, so um, uh, just be aware that you know this, this changes um, constantly into wind and solar uh, resource and. We've got years when you know the, the wind doesn't um, uh, kind of doesn't hit the, the highest levels, um, and same same on solar. So just kind of uh, factor that into your into your risk and, and thinking. Um, and another point I wanted to pick up on is around the di technological diversification. Um, really, the um, adding uh, other sources of, of of energy to your project, and especially things like uh, batteries. And generate uh, more revenues, which um, and, and different types of revenues. And what we notice is that often those revenues uh, from so from solar um, and wind versus uh, storage they actually complement each other. Um, and uh, I think that yeah, in the future that will be a, a big part of success for for making sure you've got the right levels of, of different technologies in your in your portfolio. Um, and the final point I wanted to make is, is something that's really new, and we see this with lots of uh, actually institutional investors, that they start looking at land um, as, as an asset and connecting that with, with renewables. And I think that especially community groups are really well placed for, um, for uh, perhaps becoming, uh, you know, more of a, of a land, landowner uh, and, and hosting projects on their land, and through that generating um, also uh, uh, rental uh, for, the, for the communities. Uh, specifically on the corporate, uh, corporate purchases, um, so that is a great tool for fixing the long-term power prices, um, if you can get the right level of, 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 of those, um, of those um, power prices. But they are very complex agreements to really um, to agree. So working with the experts is, is really important on that. And uh, we ourselves are trying to find ways on, on how to make uh, corporate, power price, co corporate power purchase agreements streamlined, but it's, it's really tricky. So um, uh, yeah, uh, kind of working with experts is, uh, is really the, the key. Um, and something I uh, also keep noticing very recently is that um, first corporates, um, uh, local authorities, it's very important for them to demonstrate the um, the CSR commitment. So, um, so the sort of you know uh, impact um, um, aspect, and actually for them working with local communities is a big benefit. So, when you're going to those meetings, negotiating um, 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 PPAs with, with corporates, and yeah, being community energy is a real asset and a real you should really get a, a real premium for, for that. So, I think that's also important to. Uh, to in mind. Um, right, so just a few more points uh, that in, in, in the new realities uh, we, we all um, kind of focusing on and, and looking at. Uh, one of them is size really matters. Uh, the, the larger projects have real economies of scale um, and uh, on one hand uh, just being able to negotiate bet better prices um, uh, is, is really helping those returns and boosting the, um, the, um, you know, the, the project um, returns. Um, on the other hand as well is the time that's put into larger projects is, is sometimes not that big, much more bigger than what uh, we've all been used to at the, at the low, um, smaller end. Uh, so don't be afraid of, of big schemes. It's just kind of finding the way how to get into them, but, but the, the size does really matter um, when it comes to future. Um, future projects. And just one more point I'll pick up is around the working capital, um, which I, I feel quite passionate about, just making sure that 
um, which goes back to my previous point on the on the wind um, diversity, uh, um, kind of reliability and, and solar without subsidies really make sure that you have um, you provide enough in your modeling and in your thinking about how you operate the schemes enough cash flow to make sure that um, you know you, you kind of are stable so if 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 it's uh, yeah, in in the in the summer in the wind uh, when when perhaps is, uh, your generation is lower you make sure that um, you um, kind of can go through those so really understand your technology and the, and, and 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 the seasonality as well during the year of your own technology and your own project um, that's that's going to be very important um, and final point is around the grant funding and social capital uh, it's quite interesting and quite encouraging to see that. There's so much happening uh, um, on, on that side, and many schemes are um, kind of accessing various grants, um, especially those with the, with the sort of more innovative approaches, um, which is which is really encouraged and, and, and great to see community groups stepping into that innovative kind of space. Um, so we'll be hearing later uh, from Oli, which would be great to hear about you know the innovations that uh, community groups are are currently looking into. Pretty much it uh, I prepared for today, and it would be great to um, answer any questions that um, everyone has. Thank you. Great, thanks, Monica. It's really helpful, and I think that the, with that scale becomes the potential to collaborate because I think that with revenue certainties falling, the cap the capital requirement hasn't changed, and the amount of debt accessible to these projects is probably hindered by the lack of revenue certainty. So I think that, that, that opportunity to collaborate with others um, is is really important element here. Great, thanks. Well, um, now if you're okay, Ollie, I'd like to pass over to your good self. Yeah, thanks very much, Matthew. And um, how wonderful to follow Monica and Dan, because um, I picked up a lot from both of your presentations, um, particularly Dan on the local electricity bill and behind the meter. Um, Monica on that kind of size matters and the corporate PPAs and CSA, CSR. So I'll share my screen. And um, let's see. Oh. that's working. Hold on. It isn't, but that's sorry. Hold on. It looked interesting. Yeah, no, no, it's good. <laughs> oh, sorry, hold on. Best laid plans. And we did practice this at the beginning. Oh, that was my yes, we did. <laughs> just while Ollie's doing that, then yeah, just there's there's a nice flow of questions coming in. But but do if there are questions spring to mind as we're going through, pop them in the in the Q&A and um, yeah, we'll endeavour to um, cover them at the end. No, hold on. There's a, hold on. Oh, excuse me one sec. Okay. I'll stop sharing. Yeah, Dan, I, I don't know, um, maybe what we we'll, we'll, Ollie's just looking at that then. Um, I thought it was interesting to hear you saying about the policy costs potentially migrating towards gas as opposed to electricity. I guess that's because heat is, or, or electrification is required for heat effectively in a low carbon environment. I, I didn't know how much progress had been made with that, or is it really early days in sure. the thinking there? Yeah, so um, I think, so, so there's been a discussion in the industry for a little while around it. I know there's been the, the net zero spending review from Treasury. We're still awaiting the, the, the findings from that. Um, there are uh, a few other uh, programs going on. So Bayes is exploring policy and network costs for its uh, alternative energy markets program, which it's just launched as well. Um, but uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Matthew. So it's, it's um, electricity delivered to the end user is about four to five times the price of gas. And when I think as, a, as from a policy perspective, we're trying to decarbonize heat um, and heat pumps, for example, have a coefficient of performance of three to four, 
So the, the cost differential immediately kind of wipes out the efficiency of the heat pumps. So I think from a policy perspective, given that we want to install 600,000 heat pumps per year uh, by 2028 in people's homes, um, the, 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 the ongoing operating costs, if you like, of the different assets, um, just when the counterfactual fuel is so low, just don't make a huge amount of sense. So that, that's why I think uh, government's primarily looking at performance space. Hmm. Great. That's really helpful. Perhaps that properly leveling, leveling up agenda from the government. That's great. <laughs> Thanks. Right, back to you now, Ollie. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for that and for filling in, Dan, while I sorted my presentation out. Um, so um, hopefully you can see my presentation now. Yeah, great. Um, well, hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm Oli Pendon. I'm the Chief Exec of Community Energy South and co-founder of Riding Sunbeams um, and director of Community Energy England. And we, we, which launched the State of the Sector report yesterday, which has been really helpful during um, Community Energy Fortnight. So I'll just give you an introduction to Community Energy South and then we'll, we'll dive into some examples from community energy groups. I'll talk a little bit about a mentoring program that we're doing in the Southeast called Pathways for community energy and how that links with local area energy planning and um, a bit about the greater Brighton region and some work we're doing there and a rural heat project, which I think is quite interesting from what Dan was talking about. So um, Community Energy South, we've been set up in 2013 by community energy groups in our region. We, we, we ran a mentoring program and um, nowadays um, we're there to help stimulate the growth of community energy in the southeast, like a donut around, in, around London. And um, we have a, a newsletter and we get people in with masterclasses and try and create the network really and support growth of the sector and um, get people innovating and, and employing. Uh, so partnerships are really important from a regional perspective. And um, so we do a lot of work with um, UK Power Networks, but also the local authorities and how they can sort of embed community energy into their strategies. But also we're aligned with their, particularly the larger infrastructure organisations um, like UK Power Networks, but Network Rail as well, who um, are interested, you know, are, are aligned with our principles as organised as the community energy sector and our CSR and the social impact benefits. So that's really interesting. And one example, we spent a lot of time within our network working with the water companies in the Southeast. And they were really keen to go to renewables um, through their, their price review period. And that's something that we looked at with community and water companies and the opportunity for renewables. Actually, they've done it with, with um, the private sector and are starting to go to net zero, but we're very proud of the, the part we played with that. Um, and we made sure on a regional basis that we've embedded our community energy members and groups into the regional energy strategy, um, which is run by the LEPs and the, the Greater Southeast Energy Hub. And there are, there are five hubs around the UK, and it, it's a kind of similar perspective. They're really starting to embed community in regional strategies. And that's really important from a local authority perspective. Now, um, Monica and mentioned Riding Sunbeams and our work with Riding Sunbeams. Um, this is a site where we connected and worked with um, DFT and Innovate UK to connect the first solar project to connect the railways. And that work um, with the regional energy hub and all the LEPs and the local authorities and, and bays and network rail was fundamental in making that a success. And we're now, um, we've now been awarded the Getting Building Fund to build out a, a four megawatt scheme in East Sussex and actually take this to scale. So that's really exciting and, and Thrive and the team have been really supportive on that as well as partners. Um, so, and we're also part, 
in the, we've also embedded community energy into one of the last of the European projects. In fact, there are two covering the southeast of England called the Eastern New Energy Project and the Southeast New Energy Project, which brings together 20 partners, including the Energy Systems Catapult and, and other organizations to look at, to support net zero going forward and the renewable energy sector and accelerating it. And that's, that's really important sort of last of the European projects. And we're proud to be part of that. Now, um, so we've got 42 community energy groups that we support now in the southeast of England. Um, it, it's really exciting. And here's a few of them. Um, so uh, Alton Energy and Sustainable Overton have come through on our mentoring program in our Pathways program. So they're new fledgling groups. But at the same time, we've got Energize Sussex Coast who focus on fuel poverty and vulnerability and the Brighton Energy Co-op who are leading on a project on solar canopies and, and electric charging, who, who lead, who give expertise. You know, they've been around now for over 10 years and Avesco and other groups. Um, and also there's a number of solar farms in the region uh, like Ferry Farm from Communities for Renewables have set up that have got amazing social benefits and are really driving um, solar farms in the southeast and, and supporting the, the rest of the network. Um, so we're really proud of the network that we've set up and they're very supportive and, and stronger with each other and um, regularly doing share offers. Uh, Reading Hydro have just launched their last hydro project and I think raised nearly 1.5 million um, to get that off the ground and actually connected yesterday and started generating properly. So, you know, we kind of work together as a network. Now we've set up pathways as um, to build the network. So Community Energy Pathways is, is it's a communications program um, and we have a step-by-step -step process that links communications and new communities with um, the mentors from all the groups, drawn from all the groups in the Southeast, so that they can bring their expertise into those new fledgling groups. And Hampshire County Council, Essex, and South Downs National Park <coughs> Authority, and Surrey County Council now in Norfolk, uh, are all coming forward on those um, pathways program, creating new networks. And it's very in interesting to combine community energy from a bottom-up perspective with local authorities looking at trying to achieve net zero. Um, so excuse my diagram, which I put together earlier, but this is it really. So you've got local area energy plans that will lead to net zero. And um, so you've got large authorities really committing to net zero and the leaders in those authorities wanting to, to look at their own portfolio, but also the communities to go to net zero. And then we're creating community energy networks below that on a, on a regional perspective that can feed in and advocate and bring in community finance and other links to the network and, and community energy options. So I really do think that it's, it's a case of a top-down bottom-up perspective and um, and we've got a team that are really focused on that and, and dedicated to it and it's great to see new groups popping up in areas in the east where there's never been groups before and and bringing that forward and we're we're able to have sort of bring the network together and have larger conversations um, on behalf of those groups with um, new solar farm developers and investors. Um, down in Brighton, I'll give you an example quickly. Down in Brighton, there's the Greater Brighton Regional Perspective, where we've embedded 10 pledges, um, the Greater Brighton 10, which includes um, energy, kelp, forests, and all sorts towards net zero. And again, community energy is right in the heart of that, because um, we've got about seven community energy groups just in the Brighton region who are really thriving. Um, and in fact, they've got larger energy teams than the local authorities have and more expertise in some place. 
Um, and so just in the Brighton region, this is the pipeline of investable projects, um, not only community energy, but these are all large developed projects that are looking to be invested in um, and to go to scale. So it's really good that we brought all those together. Um, so the market's interesting. Now, just an example, this is, um, as well as riding sunbeams, this is a, a, a sort of something that we're creating with rural communities and heat. And it kind of aligns with what Dan was saying about the local electricity bill and behind the meter benefits. So we're building with UK Power Networks, who are a very important partner in the Southeast, and Borough Hapold, who are a sort of global energy agency, a roadmap for rural communities to go to net zero. And we're doing this, it's really a behavior change project. So the community that we're looking at has 750 homes. Um, over nearly 80% of the village has oil for heating and they want to come off oil, but it's not affordable for people to come off oil and go to air source heat pumps. But what we said to the Energy Networks Association, UK Power Networks, this village is so well engaged. If they all come off oil and all go to electric vehicles, we'll blow your grid. How much will that cost you? And they said, well, that's really interesting. Let's have a look. So we're working together. We're actually simulating the village and looking at the issues of a whole village going to net zero and and how do you finance it? So we're, um, we haven't got to the solution. You know, the, the, um, the grant system doesn't work for heat at the moment or RHI. Um, so we're looking at different tools and methods to try and finance that, whether it's through mortgages or a, a community bond where my neighbor can invest and then I can install and, and benefit from that. So we're looking at solutions for that. And in November, we're going to take those solutions to um, government and see if we can expand the network, but also create jobs for local people. And in amongst all of that, we're looking to embed around this one rural village, a whole network of community energy schemes that can work behind the meter and, and get everyone's electricity bills down. So um, yeah, that's a little bit of an example of what's going on in the ground in the Southeast. Um, thank you very much. I'll pass on to Simon. Thanks, Holly, that's really helpful. And obviously tons of really good work going on. There's a, as you would see, um, there's a few questions um, appearing in the Q and A okay. <laughs> around, around how, how to source that funding, how to find those funding sources. So we'll come back to that. Um, following on from Simon's presentation, but for now we'll pass over to Simon. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Matthew. And I'm, I'm, I'm Simon Roberts. I'm the chief executive at the Centre for Sustainable Energy. We're a national charity uh, based in Bristol, and um, we've been supporting community energy groups for more than 20 years now. But a particular role that I'll be drawing on, mainly done by colleagues in the in in our uh, team of now 90 people, is is we lead the consortium for the Next Generation program, Power to Change setup particularly looking at innovative uh, business models. So, and for full disclosure, I'm also the chair of the board for Thrive Renewables, which is probably why you've got me here rather than the people who actually know about this stuff from our office, because it was harder for me to refuse an invitation. Um, I'm gonna focus on community-led action that's delivering sustainable energy projects. I think it's always worth stepping back and going and thinking we shouldn't underestimate the importance of community-led action that engages citizenry, develops understanding, creates a sense of shared purpose, puts pressure on those that in power but isn't trying to get out there and build assets that's actually very important as well but obviously the focus here is on uh, those those initiatives that are building projects and I've got sort of three observations to share the first uh, is um, that it's all about new business models uh, we've talked a bit about private wire and local supply and and uh, stacking value on flexibility and EV charging and lots of buzzwords floating around um, these all have much higher risks, they have tighter margins, they're more complicated, they need more focus. Uh, that tends to mean also they'll be less generous in terms of being able to generate a lot of value to a community in terms of a fund to do something else with. Uh, and it also means that because of that need for greater focus, it potentially reduces 
the number of other things that communities typically want any individual project to do. So that, that's a sort of first thing. But when I say it's about new business models, uh, it's not really. We're not trying to create some clever derivative or, um, or financial engineering. This is basically uh, the business is still the same. You need to get more income over time than you've got costs over time. That's the Macorber sort of principle. It's never really changed. If you don't do that, you face misery. If you do do that, you face happiness, I think is the way he, he characterized it. Um, so, and it's still much the same. It's just that the, the sources of income are shifting as, and I've listed a few of those already as have, have Dan and, and Oli and, and Monica. Um, but also there's a different shape to the costs in terms of the sorts of kit you have to buy and, the, and also the, the, the balance between sort of um, ongoing costs and, and, uh, and understanding. Uh, which affects the type of funding that you um, that you can 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 raise, be that needing more equity rather than debt, because the, the banks are, as yet are slightly nervous about some of these more um, new business models or different different income streams. In effect, is what they're worried about uh, that are maybe less reliable than than uh, have been in the past. Um, but it also means that there's money for innovation in a way that there wasn't when the feed-in tariff was around um, through. As Ollie's pointed out, the distribution network operators, uh, UK research and investment, uh, innovation, UKRI, the, the, in England, the energy hubs, um, and, a, and a lot of experience to, to draw on. Um, but it it does need a different approach. And as I say, may, may need uh, community organisations planning projects to be a little bit more uh, focused in, in the type of project they're trying to do in order to, to do that and not assume that the sorts of generosity we could find in feed-in projects in the past is going to be available in the future so just being realistic about about getting on with it so that's the first observation it is about new business models but it's basically about new sources of income different types of costs and um as a result particularly of, of the sense that these are innovative there is money available for innovation the second one is that community energy groups don't actually have any superpower um but they have got plenty to offer they haven't got a superpower because they can't buck the market or rewrite basic commercial commercial logic and we get involved quite a lot of people coming to us saying well we we're going to do this and you go but no one's ever done that no one's managed to make that sort of operation stack up and uh, the, the the most obvious one i get thrown at quite a lot is um is to develop a completely cooperatively owned building supply chain um i know carbon carp are doing a pretty good job at trying to do that in greater manchester but they're generally working with with creating a structure for privately owned businesses to join rather than assume you can do that. But it, it also comes back to the basic commercial logic that, uh, and it's always very telling, if there isn't anyone who's done this before in the private sector, managed to pull it all together, um, then, then it's probably because there are genuine limitations in how to, um, how to pull this together. For, as an example, flexibility markets, and Dan could comment on this, still a lot of issues about stacking revenue and being able to generate particular um uh, sort of making a lot of making decent money out of, of that and making a business case for it particularly in the main area that community groups are like to be involved in which is more flat which is more domestic sector where we haven't even got smart meters in yet so we've got to be thinking we're not we, we aren't going to be able to break system we are going to need to wait for markets to be ready rather than assume that we can do it but that's also one of the reasons why there is grant funding for innovation because it gives you a chance to try some of these out sort of working around some of those limitations in the same way that, that dnos are doing that through their innovation projects um but you do community energy groups do have something others don't have um which is or don't have as well i don't think it's a unique uh, feature of community energy groups uh, it's the potential to be a trusted intermediary to recruit reach potential takers up of local services and and provide provide that at a local level for certain aspects of something but for that a there's a need to be highly professional team up typically with those who are trying to do some of these things like aggregators who've got the kit and the technology or the or the platforms car club providers heat network developers others who may be bringing more into the mix the now than was typically the case when community energy groups were building uh and owning um solar farms in the past so needing to think about that but also um you know distribution network operators and others um or even potentially larger community energy groups are already in the mix um or, or charities like ourselves who who've got projects which need to benefit from that sort of intermediary role so <clears throat> think 
thinking kind of quite carefully about about um, the ability to buck the market or, or not, and not assuming you have a superpower, I think is quite important. And then the, the sort of third rule is about um, actually what, what we're seeing and in, in, in terms of scaling, the kind of building on past success is seems to be key to me. Most of the groups that we see active in this field, most of the groups that have got involved in the next generation innovation program and i'll put a link up at the end to links to all those groups and what they found out and a really good series of innovation uh webinars uh held fairly recently around this which i know community energy england was very supportive and uh of as well um but that's uh what those groups have found partly because of the generosity of the tariffs they were getting on their existing projects is their ability to um either allocate money at risk to do new things and take it take take some of those risks uh, or were in a position where they'd managed to uh, fund some professional staff that could start looking at these innovation funds and develop projects and so forth. So they could establish those partnerships and had a track record of being able to deliver things. So they could go into those partnerships sort of on a much more equal footing than in effect as someone who's who's been given a job as sort of door knocking at a local level. And you see that, for example, in, in NADA Community Car Club. Uh, in Wiltshire, in Bath and West Community Energy's Flex Community Project, looking at trying to develop Flex uh, Flex Community. Things. Both of those drew on innovation funding to try things out and learn a lot, so that as the the more commercial income streams and the markets start to deliver that value, they're in a position to to step in and and shift from a sort of more grant innovation type a uh, risk capital type of approach and do think of those grants as risk capital rather than assuming you're going to raise it from other people into a position where they're where they're able to um to do that um but also in terms of building on that past success um we also know there are new groups who are coming in people who have awoken to the climate emergency if you like and and, and believe in the need to do something and may have found that there isn't something in their area of setting things up um and what we've managed to do within the next generation program is develop a really excellent set of mentors who've got experience a number of whom i think are probably on the call uh, in in developing community energy groups but also trying out some of these new business models and and they get drawn upon but there has been a slight hiatus in pushing that hard because um someone involved in it had, had a um a, a family bereavement that they needed to take but it's it's live it's again i'll put a site up but there's <clears throat> what's actually proved to be a problem which i think is something we all need to reflect on is um we can we found the mentors quite easy there's a lot of people willing to provide support uh, be funded to do that but actually to provide it and pass on their learning and understanding and provide a bit of challenge and support to new groups people looking to learn what we found was there's a lot of people coming forward with something to say far fewer that seem to want to learn or acknowledge others who've, all, who've already trodden this path and i do think that's something community energy sector as a whole kind of could could do a bit of thinking about in terms of how it recognizes the sort of um, leaders but also and i think it's you know naturally if you're in a place and no one else has been doing something and you've come to it now you may well think that no one else has ever done this stuff before but there's an awful lot of help out there and what we found in that program is actually it's people seem less ready to take it up than you'd have thought they should be if they're particularly given the complexities of the market they're now in so i'm just going to very quickly share um the slides so you've got those links that i mentioned um they also include a um, link to a blog by our by Keith Hempshell, our head of um, local and community empowerment on uh, for, for community energy fortnight on 10, 10 uh, rules for community energy action success. I'll leave that up just for a little bit and pass back to you, Matthew. Thanks, Simon. It's great, <clears throat> helpful insight as ever. Um, so now, yeah, we, we're moving to the Q and A section. I'll try and there's been a healthy flow of questions, so I'll uh, try and distribute. So what I might do is do a batch um, for for the panel. So um, Dan, it would be helpful if you could respond to some of Jake's questions on the Q and A. I think you can see those. Um, if you can't, let me know. Um, and then um, it would be helpful, perhaps Ollie, if you could. Um, comment on some of the partnerships between community energy and local authorities um, which is something that's come up um, and also some of the, the funding sources available for, for, for community energy projects that'd be really helpful if you cover that um, Monica 
um, it would be helpful. There's been a question around um, a one-stop shop funding solution for communities. So it might be helpful if you could cover that one. And just while you're th or thinking about that, um, I'll respond to, um, to a question that's come from um, Emma Bridge of Community uh, Energy England itself um, around the sort of tax efficiency um, or tax efficient structures for investing um, in renewable energy. So, and, and, and community energy. So, I think at the moment, um, I guess one of the probably one of the most effective tax incentives or, um, for investment in renewables was the Enterprise Investment Scheme, scheme for EIS. Um, and that was working very well, particularly in the solar feed in tariff rock boom. Um, but that that has been closed down principally because projects were, you know, investors were benefiting both from the tax break on the investment and and also on the um, from from the support provided to those schemes. So that's no longer an option. I think something which is very live and present um, is where um, debt products or debt instruments, so community bonds are put in place and raised around projects, they can qualify for what's called, or often can be wrapped into an innovative finance ISA, which is very tax efficient for the investor. Um, and so it can be held within the, 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 the investor's ISA pot. Um, the areas which probably are a bit harder to crack at the moment uh, around the inclusion in pensions. So, Structurally, there's nothing stopping a lot of um, uh, investments being held in um, a person's SIP, and this isn't tax. This isn't tax advice, by the way. Um, but th so there's nothing structurally stopping uh, in investments being held in people's SIPs. But typically, if the if the underlying business or enterprise is unlisted, then um, the IFA, so the independent, independent financial advisors, won't tend to go near it. So really, at the moment, probably the best thing is to structure things which are, or structure investment, which is eligible for the innovative finance ISA. But again, I'm not offering advice on this because I'm not qualified to, but that's just a sense of where the market is. So maybe um, we'll move to Dan now um, to cover some of Jake's points. Great, thanks, Matthew. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just read them out as I go. So um, the first one was, please, could you explain the distribution access rights opportunity? Um, this is this is a great great question. The, the short answer to that, unfortunately, uh, Jake is is actually no, not in not in great detail. Um, so we'll know a lot more when the Minder Two decision comes out from Ofgem on the forward looking and access SCR. Um, what we do know is that Ofgem's exploring having time profiled or more specific access rights within that and presumably therefore your access rights to the uh, so your charges if you like for having access to the network um, would be lower um, and also shared access as well so you've got um, so you've got end consumers within the local area and let's say a, a, a small scale uh, generation asset within the area maybe within the same um, substation um, area. Um, so Ofgem's looking at, okay, so um, if there's a, a local kind of pocket of shared access, then, you know, what do the charges look like? Will there be rewards? Is there, you know, is there a, a lower um, kind of charging threshold for those users, if you like? Um, we, we don't know exactly how that's going to come through in distribution costs. For example, um, that there's a lot still to be ironed out, but they're the kind of things that Ofgem is exploring. Um, and as I say, you know, we, we need to wait for Ofgem's Minded Two position to really see the detail of how that's going to work. We, we don't have enough detail at this point to to really kind of point the finger at it, other than to note, look, you know, if, if you're interested in local small scale energy located near some demand users, then you know there might be there might be a specific opportunity there um, for for sharing those access rights and quite how that comes through in terms of the network charges is still to be defined a little bit but as i say uh, we'll await that minder two de decision with uh, with interest um, i'm just going to jump to jake's third question quickly so do you think we'll see any change to transmission cancellation uh, change liabilities which is substantially increasing the risk investment uh, involved in developing a community solar project. Um, 
yeah, interesting question. It wasn't one that I was uh, uh, specifically uh, aware of being a, a particular barrier for community energy projects. So really interested here uh, more on that. Uh, Jake, I'm not aware of any immediate changes going through for that, but um, yeah, as I say, very interested to to, to hear um, what the particular issue is there. And uh, the, the second one, how are solar funds looking at subsidy-free revenue streams? I think uh, that's a, that's a really interesting question. So, um, with with solar uh, particularly, so, so solar generates um, at you know, uh, during daylight hours, obviously peaks during uh, uh, around midday, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, solar, if, if you were to invest, I think solely in, in a, a solar asset, there is a substantial kind of market risk. So um, as Monica spoke about, if, if you're reliant entirely on um, power prices and um, your embedded benefits, and you only have a single kind of technology there, so there's no diversification, you are heavily exposed to the, the market price and, and market risk. Um, so what we tend to see people doing when they're looking at, at, at solar, and it's worth noting as well, the more solar we roll out, the more there will be a, a, a peak of generation uh, during the middle of the day, and there might be an increasing kind of cannibalization effect on the on the market rate during the mid middle of the day. So what we're seeing is people looking at um, uh, so so panels facing slightly different directions. We're looking at people uh, over um, sizing their solar assets for the connection. So they are effectively exporting more during the shoulder periods. So they're not as exposed to that kind of cannibalization effect. We're also looking at diversification. So people exporting part or all of that solar through a private wire. Um, and uh, we're also looking at um, uh, mixtures uh, with other technologies as well. So battery storage, et cetera, diversifies the revenue streams that you're uh, involved in and, and can potentially benefit from um, and ensures that all of your eggs aren't necessarily in one basket, um, so to speak. So that's that's what we're, we're tending to see. But that's such a broad question. I don't know if there are any other views uh, from the panel. I suspect as well in terms of um, the scale really matters, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, if you are buying panels for a 100 megawatt scheme, <laughs> the cost of those will be a lot um, yeah, very different from uh, if you're buying it for a small private wire even. Um, I think that that cost is really, uh, really making a change in the model. Um, and the, the other kind of interesting question now is inflation, uh, what people assume on, on inflation. Um, that's um, uh, you know the, the back of pandemic. That's not very clear picture what will happen. And at this moment, it's very it's, it's quite high, but it might not you know it might go up or, or down. Um, but uh, that that can generate a huge um, change in in a model as well. Um, so yeah. yeah, but you know from our perspective, we it's important to be careful uh, with these kind of assumptions. Nice, thanks, Monica. Um, I'm conscious that we're, we're rapidly running out of time. Um, there have been a couple of questions around the, the, the interaction with local authorities, you know, the, the climate emergencies, the local plans uh, are really helpful steps in the right direction, but how, how some of that's turning into concrete action and how community energy can sort of engage with that directly. I don't know, Ollie, have you got a sense for that or anyone else from the, the, the panel? Do I say again, Matthew? So in terms of the, the interaction between local authorities... Yeah, yeah and, exactly. And, and and I, energy. Sorry, and I was actually answering a question, the question in the, in the Q&A, and it's, it's come from the team at Energy Systems Catapult, actually, who are doing those higher level local area energy plans, preparing the local authorities. And um, yeah, there are lots of good examples historically from groups to work with local authorities like Plymouth Energy Community or Vesco, where I'm sitting today, have got a great working relationship with the local authority. Oxford. Um, and Oxford, low carbon Oxford, of course. Thank you, Liz, <laughs> um, sitting next to me. Um, but that's what we're trying to do in, in Pathways is create that network that's actually, it's embedded by the local authorities. So they want 
you know, the community energy groups now to come forward so they can interact with them. And then we can interface the expert groups with the new the, the new starters. So lots of examples. Yeah, do email me and I'll give you some live examples offline. Um, the other can I just can I funding, just um, Simon? The other question was about funding. The Royal Community Energy Fund is there. It's run by the the energy hubs. Um, it looks like it's going to be extended. Um, we're talking about them now about extending it long term, um, and so and that's something for groups to look at feasibility studies. And it's it's great fund. And potentially extending to urban spaces as well, because it was always a slightly weird distinction between them. Just on the local authority stuff, um, I would uh, say to people, don't don't wait for a local authority to come to you or necessarily assume that even if they're doing some work on a local area energy plan, that's tied into anyone who might actually take initiative in a local authority. It's a sort of need to think of this. I think I said to I put a blog out about it about a year ago. Um, you need to think of this as more like jazz than a Mozart symphony. This is not something where someone has written out exactly what's going to happen over the next 10 years in any given place, even if they've got a local area energy plan. Uh, you can't nail it down that much. You need to think about what the first next steps are and how you start moving in, in an appropriate direction. We know what the chord sequence is. We need to phase out gas, phase out internal combustion engine, eat less meat, do fly less, you know, all those things we know we've got to do. Exactly what they look like in any, any given place is dependent not only on how that place is engaging with it but also obviously as a relation to that national policy it's too complicated to write it all down so we just need people to start joining in and not assuming someone's going to cue them in and uh, tell them when to start or that a local authority is the place where all those answers will come from um though obviously they do have access to funds potentially if they can get their act together and um persuade the government that they have the right caliber of uh, uh to to take it through i hesitate to say and the right uh, political colour council these days but that seems to be becoming an increasing issue but anyway so yeah I, I would um and do have a look at it on our website if you type in local area energy planning you'll see some more work on um we did actually with the energy system catapult on a sort of method for the Ofgem uh been promoting as as a way to to think about how those things should be done and that includes what sort of stakeholder engagement should be done thanks very much and I'm afraid, yeah, we're pretty much out of time, but we will, there's there's some other questions there which we'll endeavour to respond to um, directly. Um, so thank you very much for those. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it informative and I really appreciate the input from the team here on the panel. So thank you very much, everyone, for that. And um, yeah, all the best with developing more community energy. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.